Hi, I'm Tracy Swedlow, and this is Television Nation. Uh, I'm the host of this show, and we also produce TVOT conferences, and I hope you will check us out at tvotshow.com. But to my right or to my left, I'm not sure how this will wind up um, in post, but we'll see. I have the great, the only, the original Dave Morgan, CEO of Simul Media. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Tracy. I'm excited to be here. Well, uh, so much going on, and you're, I think you're such a great person to talk to, to try to understand, to make sense of this, um, because I noticed, you know, reading your, your bio, which I've looked at it different in the past, but it sort of dawned on me that you've, you've done some things at different times, at the right time, you've sold exactly at the right time, you were purchased at the right time, like you, you sold your first, uh, one of your businesses in 2007 to AOL, Right, right before the crash. Yes. yes. I mean, you know, how did you know that? Um, <clears throat> I didn't, but I think, you know, I mean, I guess to put it in perspective, you know, I do think we're going through an extraordinary time right now and it's a terrible situation, but also as business people, part of our obligation and particularly when you're running a business is to have a capacity to step back and try to gain perspective on what's happening around you, what's happening in your market, what's happening to your people. Um, and so, yeah, I've been doing the technology startups for 25 years now, um, continuously, except for a couple months when I left AOL before starting Simul Media. I have been through the currency crash in 97, the dot-com bubble, 9-11, the financial crisis. And I think that, you know, one of the things that I've gotten from it are that um, you have to recognize a lot of things that matter are not in your control. They just aren't. And so you have to focus on the things that are in your control. And you also have to realize that um, the numbers that people say are only relative. They're not real. Whenever a company is private, when we're working in these markets, when someone thinks their company is of a certain value, it's not until it's actually cash. And so when I look at what's happening today with this global health crisis and having navigated some startups through different paths, there's an awful lot of companies that have raised money anticipating they were going to have a really substantial exit at a particular time. And they weren't necessarily as focused on building a business that was sustainable for a long time. And so that matters. I think the reason you mentioned um, the exit of Dakota, but right before the financial crisis to AOL, well, one of the reasons that you know we were fortunate in timing was we had a business that was growing really fast. It was becoming quite profitable. And it was at a time when a lot of people could tell that the market was a bit overheated and that we were already seeing bumps in the market. You had already seen some hiccups. And so we knew that um, we needed a bigger partner and Microsoft and AOL both came calling and we picked the one with the best opportunity. You know, you, um, what I, what I find interesting about your background and the business that you're in is that, uh, uh, you started out as an attorney and as my father who, yes. who was an attorney, he told me what he learned to do in law school was to think he didn't necessarily learn the law. And I don't know if that's a cliche in the law business, but it, it sort of it, it allows you to source the priorities or to slim down the priorities to, to separate the wheat from the chaff to understand what's really important, like what you just were talking about. It's like a skill set. And I notice in your columns, for example, that you do on media post, you really are very good at slimming you know, the, making the argument. Right. And, and bringing us into a thought process and slimming down your the language to get to the point very quickly. And so I think it's interesting that you're also in the business of trying to help your customers do those same things, right? To figure out exactly what are the most important things you need to do, how to slim all that down, how to be efficient, how to think intelligently, quickly. And I, I'm just, I'm, I mean, I'm not here to make compliments necessarily, but I just thought, a, I just thought it was interesting. There was sort of like a through line for me and you know you're always such an intelligent speaker at our conferences, so I just wanted to 
uh, point all of that out a little bit. Um, I mean, uh, and there's so many questions I want to ask you about the situation that we're in um, to talk about the ad business and the, how the TV industry is going to go forward. But I know you want to respond to what I just said. So Yes, well, my father would be proud that you said that since he was a lawyer also, so thank you. Um, yeah, I think one of the things that law training does, and quite frankly, you probably had an experience like I did, which is, you know, I had a law training I felt well before I went to law school because it happened at the dining room table or the kitchen table. Um, you know, we were, I was always required to start with the facts, synthesize different facts together, analyze the result and come to a conclusion and justify it. And that's, that's how I was brought up all of my life. And so I was always brought up with an assumption that I'm not an expert because the lawyer needs to be the one to interrogate. You may develop expertise, but you have to really be asking questions. You have to be listening. You have to be seeing things. You have to find where things fit and you put them together. And so to me, I think that's resourceful, right? You have to be very yes. resourceful and you have to be persistent. Yeah. And so I think that training has served me well. I I had some training in technology and I was interested in science and that helps me, but I'm not an engineer and I'm not a salesperson and I'm not a product person. Um, but I think maybe I'm a business person because I can pull those things together. And so I think that's helped me also get better now because I can also put the patterns together over time of all the things I, you know, that I haven't known. So you know, as I said, my father would be proud. He passed away a number of years ago, but he'd be very happy to hear that my law training made a difference. Well, he, he raised a good sign. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So uh, there's a, let's dive into the industry because I know you mm -hmm. have very strong uh, opinions about that. Um, but shortly, I want people to have a basic understanding if they don't already know what Simul Media is, um, what it is that you guys do. Uh, I know you help companies develop media campaigns, develop um, and predictive analysis by inserting um, some code on their websites. And you have a, a lot of other uh, things such as your VAMOS platform. Now I'm speaking for you, but go, go ahead, go ahead. The simplest way to describe what we do is we bring a digital approach to TV advertising. TV reaches an enormous number of people still more than any media channel and any, you know, in all of the households in all of America, it's about almost four hours of viewing per person per day. But the systems are archaic. The way it's bought, the way it's sold, the way it's measured, the way it's attributed. And we try to mix the best of digital and the best of TV so that you can bring in software to automate it. So it's not just phone calls and faxes. You can bring in um, predictive data analytics to have a better sense of what where audiences will be in the future. And we fundamentally, the area we focused on is audience-based advertising so that you can buy campaigns across all of the major national TV networks, not just based on the show. Like I want to be in Tiger King because I've got to be there. Oh, you can't, because that's on Netflix and that's a problem. What you want, you, it, there's no ad support there. So, but when you need to be in a TV show and you need, and you want something just in the content, you want to find a particular kind of person, like people that watch Tiger King on Netflix to watch streaming, you need systems that can track where 300 million people watch TV, what specific shows are beyond and how you can best reach them in the future. And then you need the automated systems to execute it. And so we basically have built a turnkey system for closed loop advertising on, on linear TV, old fashioned TV. Okay, so um, I know that uh, the, 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 well, well, we all know, right, that the TV industry is drastically being affected by COVID-19. Uh, you're at home wearing a, a, a rac raccoon Yeah, this is where... Catskill, Catskill Brewery. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Um, and maybe you can order from them. But anyway, yeah. oh, cool. Uh, but the industry is drastically changing. People are watching more TV, although I believe it's falling off from what I understand from your recent research, the, the, mm -hmm. the amount of hours that people are, are pursuing. And yet the networks are having to make enormous changes um, because advertisers are pulling back. 
Uh, maybe some advertising advertisers are more proactive and, and more intelligent about figuring out this. Whole, it's a big mishmash mess, right? Yes. There's a lot of change going on. So I want to hear what you think are some of the important trends that we should notice right now. Um, and the top five things that you think, top th two or three, if you can, whatever, but um, things that you think that we should be doing right now, we should be noticing uh, in order to make the best changes possible so that when we're through this or further down the line, um, when we understand, we have a grip on what what's happening and we're not still in shell shock mode, you know, what we can do to, to um, help the industry survive and thrive. Because I, I mean, uh, for example, I know you are interested in what Linda Yaccarina said. Um, you know, she has all these ideas of the things that she wants to do with sea flight and so on and so forth. But I mean, how can all of this take place in this huge moment of chaos? Is that, it's a big question, I suppose. Yeah, well, I think a few, well, I'll sort of look at where some of the facts are that I think they're important. One, as you mentioned, TV viewing is up. It is plateauing now, so we're not seeing the same increases week over week we saw through March. Mm -hmm. But um, we're up probably depending overall about 12 to 20% of total TV viewing. It makes sense. People are home. Many people are not working, um, unfortunately. And so, the, you know, TV viewing is up. Streaming, you know, linear TV is up. Streaming is up. Um, video gaming is up. Live streaming. Is live streaming TV? Live streaming is up, right? We're all yeah, watching. Yeah, live streaming is up. Yes. Platform. And it's TV and then a lot of and a lot of narrow casts like your show. These are there's so much more of this being consumed. Interesting podcasting is down. Because audio podcasting podcast. audio yeah. podcasting, you mean? Mm -hmm. Audio podcasting is down probably because people built their habits around their commute. What am I doing in my car? Right. Right. What am I doing mm -hmm. in the subway? What am I doing when I'm walking to the to 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 work? So we'll see as those those habits shift back. But also when people are home, we go back to the old phenomena that is really important for people to remember, which is largest screen available. When people have a choice, they go to the largest screen available. And now that people are home, you see much more viewing on the TV devices and you see viewing of content that can be viewed on TV devices and PC devices and laptop devices more so than mobile devices. So, so, so that's important. Now we are gonna see these behaviors change. Now what's happening in the TV industry that's, that's really disrupting it. Um, a lot of the television industry has been built over the last two decades on tentpole events. Once you started seeing 100 plus channels and then 800 channels and thousands of channels, um, you, saw, you saw more of a focus on just prime time, top shows, sporting events for the core economics of the TV networks, the national networks, and the rest of the things they added is packaging. Mm -hmm. They added with them. Now, when packaging was only 20%, when the things that weren't 10 poles were just 20% of total inventory, it was pretty simple. And 12 people could negotiate with six people, and they could basically make an allocation of forty-five, the $44 billion in national TV pretty quickly. But now that those 10 poles only represent 20, 30% of the total inventory and 80% are across all of these hundreds of channels, it's much more difficult for the old procedures to work. So what's happened today is that we don't have the live sporting events. Mm -hmm. We don't have a future sense of what the highly produced um, primetime shows are going to be because they can't do the pilots because they can't get the production teams together and you can't get shooting schedules. And so we don't know what we're going to have in the fall, except that we know we probably won't have the new shows like we are used to having them. Nor can you even have the unscripted programming because you can't get the cast together. So, so we're going to see a really big change. So the TV viewing is up. A significant amount is up on news. And, you know, hopefully the news becomes less important in our lives and that goes down. And I mean this and someone that former media lawyer and cares about news, that I'm, I'm hoping that it becomes less impactful in our lives and we can move through things. Entertainment programming is up. Watching reruns is up incredibly. People that watch streaming services, the one thing they watch when they're not watching streaming services, live streaming services, they watch Friends. Soothing things, things that... Yes. Uh, yeah, so a lot of the entertainment programming, kids British, programming British is up. Show. 
British yeah, banking. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you have. So, so, so I think there are, are probably some longer term trends. So you asked for two to five things. I think one, um, we're going to have to do a better job in shorter periods of time understanding TV viewing habits and where to best buy ads. And so we won't see a return to a normal annual upfront schedule for a year or two because there will not be predictability in the schedule. So I think we're going to see more focus on tent poles and making decisions sooner. But I go ahead. Yeah. Well, I know that, um, you know, uh, I, you called in one of your columns for um, for us to pay more attention to Linda Yaccarino's interest in sea flight. Yes. Uh, which is, you know, tracking across all the platforms, live streaming included. Um, but, you know, it's still very difficult to, it's, it's impossible, right, to understand what's happening in some of these OTT platforms like Netflix, as you were saying. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and if more people are moving to these OTT platforms, I don't know how C-Flight or any of these initiatives are going to take place. And then, and then on the flip side of that, I see on an article on uh, Deadline, was it yesterday? Uh, you know, Linda Yaccarina, it, Linda Yaccarino, who is in favor of, putting advertising through all these other platforms, measuring them, she is retooling everything they're doing. I'm looking at the article on my screen. So um, I, you know, I read she, it as well. Yes, you did. Yeah. So I'm kind of curious what you think about um, those two sort of competing in, um, issues. One is the desire to track against all platforms. And yet now she is uh, going to be scaling stuff back, giving things away for free. Um, having less commercial airtime, I'm reading this stuff, uh, giving partners more access to remote production teams and brand ads. I mean, they're doing all kinds of things, I think, to support their advertising community through this difficult time so they can maintain their business. Uh, what do you think about those initiatives? Are they going to change everything that they're doing? Are marketers going to expect those things when this is over, how are we going to re how are we reinventing the ad t the TV ad business on a daily basis? So are, are these, are, give you are, is anybody else, do you know if anybody else is, are, you know, is doing those kinds of things? I'm asking like five yeah. questions in one. That's okay. So the simple answer is yes. Um, okay. People are going to expect that those things, she is trying to do everything that the marketers are asking for and others to the extent they aren't doing the same things are doing some things, but more people will do those. But I'm going to go to the beginning of your question first, which is how do we deal with all these channels like Netflix and the desire for advertisers to reach them with ads? Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing is they have to get to reality, which is you can't. There aren't ads on Netflix. There aren't ads on Amazon Prime. They're not ads on Disney Plus. They're not ads on Apple Plus. They're not going to be ads on um the new HBO Max product. And so for all of the viewing, about 20% or so right now of all viewing on TV is on a streaming service, is from a streaming service. But only 3% of the advertising shown on TV comes from streaming services because even Hulu that has the ads has very few. And so advertisers have to realize that's like the old DVD and home video and pick it up at, at um, you know, Blockbuster, you can't get ads there. Maybe you can try to get an ad in the beginning. Maybe you can get a product placement. It's like trying to put an ad on HBO. You can't. So advertisers need to get back away from that. They need to recognize that they have to focus on where the ads are and where the audiences are. And platforms like Linda's are really strong there. However, we do need to follow her C-Flight initiative, I believe, and that really trying to build apples to apples comparisons between what people watch, ads they watch on the TV programming, on the streaming products, on the ad supported streaming products where this, the same content is shown, on digital video, on things on their phones. They may not all be priced the same, but at least we need to find ways to come to, you know, develop some apples to apples. And the industry hasn't been that interested in doing that because it hasn't been so broken, it had to be fixed. And I would argue that what's happening now is breaking it so badly that it needs to be fixed. And I think. Linda's leadership here is going to make a really big difference into the future. Um, she is reducing ad load. One of the best ways to deal with keeping your pricing up when, you're, when your volume it goes up higher and your demand goes down is reduce the inventory for sale. And so it was actually a chance to scale back what's happened over the last half dozen years when ad load increased as ratings decreased, but mm -hmm. demand went up. She's done the reverse. I think we will see more of that. 
that'll help normalize things. It's no different than the oil companies keep the oil in the ground or they keep it in tankers um, when the winter isn't so cold and they don't want to put massive fluctuations into the market. So I think that she's taking some really smart steps and I'm really hopeful that they are some of the kinds of steps that will help lead companies through this. Do you think that um, they might evolve into a, 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 you know, even though it's linear, but some kind of um, subscription-based system that includes ads? I don't see NBC ever, you know, giving up ads, but I mean, maybe a subscription system where there are less ads, you know. I think that subscription services. Well, they have a relationship with their viewers, you know what I mean? Like, it seems to be like. Yeah, well, certainly, I mean, we know we're still expecting, I'm sure, to see Peacock launched, although it won't have the Olympics to launch it. Um, that was to be <clears throat> ad supported. I think the market's already pretty crowded in the ad free subscription service market. And so I can't imagine too many people going into it. The second reason is that if you look at the facts, the market is finite. Um, and there's 330 million people in the United States, about 300 million-ish that watch television. Mm -hmm. And 35% of those do not have fixed broadband at home. It's one of the reasons that so much of America cannot do online schooling right now. Uh, it's one of the big reasons that New York City kept the students in school, even after others were talking about mm. um, sending them home, because almost 50% of the students in New York City schools don't have fixed broadband at home, and they don't have the capacity to go online. So. So you were immediately looking at what's essentially a luxury product to probably having a maxing out at about 80 million, 90, 85, 90 million homes in the United States. And so I think that um, going for after other companies that are subsidizing those products with other businesses, Amazon for logistics and distribution delivery for its e-commerce business, um, Apple for hardware sales, Disney for overall brand subsidy and its other products, they all have this sort of what they call in the venture capital world, unfair competitive advantage. They can afford to offer something for free that others have to charge for. And so I don't know that it would make sense for NBC Universal to put out an ad free product. I think the Peacock is a smart service. The big issue is how do you launch it into the teeth of what will certainly we're now in the beginning of what will be a, a multi-quarter recession almost for sure. Uh, I actually, um, I the pointing out the, uh, the disparity in the country for access to broadband and in light of the fact that we, we need to educate our kids at home right now for, uh, for how long we don't even know, for, uh, which is an interesting observation because, um, I'm, I think potentially that, that, um, that is an opportunity that is being missed that could be potentially pursued by all of these networks. How can they retool online entertainment into online or, or to television and entertainment? They used to offer education and television. You know exactly. what I mean? a huge opportunity for advertisers, for platform operators, for the television networks. I mean, because education is evergreen. Yes, evergreen. I grew up. I grew up in a small coal town in Pennsylvania where we actually had cable TV before almost anybody did. It was invented in Pennsylvania um, um, in, in the Eastern part, but you know, in the 1960s when I was in you know, elementary school and, and then early seventies, like we had cable TV shows shown inside the classroom for education and not just documentaries, but the programming that was made for education. I totally agree. I think that we're all learning so much more about what does it mean to learn from home? And the amount of capacity and the distribution that the TV companies have to do that. Everybody complains, oh, Disney's got Disney Channel and they have no ads and they own all the kids. It's like, wait a minute, why don't you go in and really start developing educational programming for a one-to-many delivery, which is not unlike how a lot of education is done today, building all of the online resources to let them go deeper, mirror Khan exactly. Academy things, or, huge well, opportunity. PBS has been pursuing that perspective for quite a long time. I, In fact, you could offer that as a, a for sale service. It could be subscribed yes. to, there's entertainment, There's a, you can organize all your historical documentaries, which I know you love, right? Mm -hmm. yes. uh, like the History Channel, could be something you could um, 
the, ed, the history education channel, right, could be something kids could subscribe to. All right, we've invented a whole new business. We have to. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure. <laughs> I'd love that. I mean, just think about all those classes that are being offered out there in the world. And uh, the online class industry is, is, is hopping and people are teaching each other. And there's a lot of new forms of video being made and people are live streaming on YouTube. I, I'm i getting uh, ahead of myself here, but I mean, but, I, I, are you watching? Go ahead. See, this is exactly what we need to be thinking, which is out of these opportunities, um, are where our great businesses are built in the future. And, and a lot of people are worried about how do they get the toothpaste back into the tube and try to return us to a normalcy that we had in January or last year, and we won't. But if you recognize this is, this is the beginning of a new normal that will be dramatically different, things like how do you use television and learning at home become a real opportunity. My daughter was just asking me, I had to print out an article, two articles for her with a printer here that was terrible for, um, um, pieces written by one by Milton Freeman and, and one by Andrew Carnegie about the profit in businesses in one of our high school classes in history. And I thought that's all right, but there's a lot of deeper video that could be shown, but this was the easy way for them to do it in their online school product. And I think that a, an integrated curriculum between television programming, much like PBS did decades ago with other assets, I think, makes a big opportunity. But we could look at so many areas like this. You could look at how the cooking shows change and become, now that for sure, for sure, we're all gonna be tethered to our homes more for the next couple of years. And not because of the government requirement for now, but because there's gonna be more fear and more uncertainty. And so packaged goods companies, um, electronics companies, um, appliance companies have all of these opportunities to help deliver um, more. How do you live in your home for people that haven't been in their home so much in the last 10 years? <laughs> uh, it would be interesting to see some um, brands get together with the networks uh, to help support this and offer it. Uh, Cause I know brands in general are uh, um, very afraid of putting campaigns out. And I'm sure you're seeing that in you know mm -hmm. with your business there they don't want to be associated with covid and I'm, I'm curious are you seeing any brands that um you know that you're working with or that or that your networks are working with that are are innovating that are have figured something out that are using your platform to reach new audiences in new ways i mean is that a is that a an appropriate question are you seeing anything yeah it is i think there's a few i think probably everyone who's watched tv has seen the automakers unveil a lot of new ads talking about how the dealerships will bring vehicles to them. They'll pick the vehicles up for service. They'll do a lot of things to make them feel safer. Um, they've companies like Ford who have changed their <clears throat> uh, basically forgiving interest payments for now. Um, on our side, we're look, we, we deal with a lot of brands who are otherwise in live sports content. And they're now saying, I need to find these people in a lot of other places. And, and they're coming to us to redeploy money that they have built around, you know, big schedules of live events. And, and it's, no, it, it's fundamentally, they need to be more, they have to be more flexible. They have to be smarter. Um, they have to understand what audiences are available. We work with um, Experian and, and the Experian Boost product, for example. When things were really go-go, people were a little less concerned about how do they, um, improve their credit score? How can they better understand it? How can they um, um, improve it? How can they take changes, behavioral changes? Mm -hmm. Well, right now with 10 million unemployment claims filed in the last two weeks, and we know that there were many, many millions more people who couldn't get their claims filed because of processing errors. And so the estimates now are that almost 14% of the United States workforce is unemployed. Credit score matters a lot. They don't have chances to get this these special loans at 0% interest rates. These are people that need to feed their families, make their mortgages, pay for their cars. And so these back to basics, I think we see a lot of products and services. I think the kind of financial services and tools that only the elite or wealthy had access to before are now going to be available much more broadly. It's interesting because I remember a while ago when Periscope was hot, right, which um, maybe it'll return again, that Experian used to do a daily or even twice, maybe twice daily, live live uh, streamed session about how to improve your credit, or how to understand this or that. It seems like a back to basics channel about how to live in yeah. a digital world 
uh, would be a fantastic idea to, and to partner with the big networks. Um, we, I just, I just, <laughs> they're all, these are all great ideas. How do we tell them? I will yeah, well, tell the nation now, but these would be fantastic ideas because yeah. I think that YouTube, right, has pretty much taken over that, that yeah. job. But it's so hard to find stuff unless you're just haphazardly keyword searching that the, anybody who doesn't understand YouTube or doesn't want to just, you know, wade through all kinds of recommended channels that, you know, that they need something more curated for them. Uh, sorry, go yes. ahead. So I think the this advertising gets... community is missing, you know, that huge YouTube community yeah. out there. Right. So 100 percent. This is one of the reasons if you one of the comments. Um, that Linda Yaccarino made is they have these now more virtual production teams. So look at the production quality of this webinar. It's great. This kind of production quality was not available on most TV production 10 or 15 years ago. It's only not remote sets and you're able to do this with your own tools. So let's think about what's possible now. And I think that the television industry and production, okay, we can't get back on the lots and have the big catering thing sitting right beside it. And, you know, see stars go by us every once in a while in the golf carts, but we can actually leverage the talent that are sitting at home dealing with these issues, unboxing new appliances that, you know, an Instapot, like, you know, what can't you cook in an Instapot, but how many people have an Instapot, need an Instapot and want to know how they can cook in one. I don't know why food brands aren't jumping in and being part of that. Um, have you, you know, seen uh, Have you seen Food Network Kitchen? The yes. Food Network? That's pretty innovative. Yes, I think if if I had to call a company out that I think is doing a lot of great work in this area, and they've been doing it for years, so I a lot of confidence where they go. It's Discovery Scripts. I think the things that Scripts, and I think they manage that merger really well. I think um, I think as a sales leader, we talked about Linda. I think John Steinloff. The chief sales officer at Discovery is one of the smartest, smartest, smartest and best um, sellers out there. If you recall from the early addressable days, I mean, scripts, networks in the old version, they were out in the addressable and working in set-top boxes really early, trying to understand what the TV could look like tomorrow. And I look at what they do today, and, I, and they're, they obviously own home and hearth in the TV world. And right now, we're going to have a real big shift back to home and hearth for a long time, not just these couple months that we're um, in, you know, we're social distancing. Mm -hmm. I think we are going to see at least a half a generational shift. I think we're going to see a four, six, eight year shift towards people much more tethered to home. If, if I were Google or if I were Discovery, and not that you asked me a question, but I, I mean, <laughs> I would say, you know, this is the opportunity here. I mean, everyone talks about Google Classroom, but is Google using YouTube? Um, you know, it's all of its resources to educate kids. I don't know. I don't think so. I think they're relying on the no. teachers. I think and the teachers are overwhelmed right now yes. of trying to reinvent themselves as digital professors. I think there is a huge opportunity to help help them reach the kids and educate them, entertain them. And yet, yes, discovery, I think, is in a fantastic situation. They've got, you know, their science channels and things like that. They're much more diversified. Yeah. Um, um, go ahead. I mean, I say, on the education part, the, my opinion the home, anyway. <laughs> yeah, the learning from home. I mean, I'm fortunate that our, our girls are in high school. They're teenagers and they are quite attuned to this. But I have all of these friends who have children in primary school and they have to do that teaching. And so having those things in those aids, and if you look at it, great teaching and programming can scale, not just size, but time. So I was doing some trying to learn physics because I never learned it very well. And when I'm in your events and I sit next to someone like Seth, like Seth Haberman, I'm intimidated because he's amazing in those areas. And so, so far this year, I've been listening to, and now watching Feynman on physics, who is oh, like the per the book, the, te the textbooks of physics. And they basically videotaped his lectures between 1963 and 1965. And they are still, it's still the best physics teaching programming there is. I have some and channels to send you. I have okay. some to send you. I don't know if I can do, do it offline or tell you now. I was just going to try and do a Feynman now. Okay, so, well, I don't know if anyone's interested, but I've actually interviewed, um, uh, uh, I forgot his name. I interviewed, uh, uh, 
I'll have edit this. Um, well, he does World Science U. So if you go to worldscienceu.com, he does this fantastic uh, channel. I'll go find it. It, it interviews, um, well, he talks about time and space, and he does these things in small clips, and then he does a, a middle section with animations, and then he does a deeper dive with the math. Then he has all his friends in the physics industry. He's we um we've been covering that for many many years. I'm getting off topic here from the advertising industry. No, but this wait, is no, but, no, this is name green green green. green. Uh, wait, okay, go ahead. Yeah. I'm listening. But but the, what out. you're bringing up is so important to the future of advertising because one of the reasons <clears throat> that I suggest it's hard for the television companies to go into subscription based. Yes services that don't have ads are that there are companies in adjacent markets that are subsidizing their movies and TV show programming um, on other businesses, Apple's hardware, Amazon's e-commerce and shipping. Let's go back to channel one. Let's go back to the fact that now that more of the education is being put at home, parents might be more comfortable with transparency, a certain amount of commercial programming, supporting things. This okay. is a great opportunity to go to advertisers, to do the old Hallmark Channel kinds of things that were safe and you had a limited number of ads and you knew what it was and they said brought to you by and then here we give this to you. The opportunity for sponsorship, the masters that only had two advertisers for years and years and years and light ad loads. There's an enormous opportunity. Do you for remember the Western Civilization, uh, that series? Do you remember that? Uh, yes, by, I do. Uh, what is his name? He's gone now. But I used to watch all those programs late night on my little black and white TV uh, on uh, when I was a kid that I would yeah. sneak from my mother's office, you know? Yeah. yeah. This, so, so we know education is going to change dramatically coming out of this. We know how you live in your home is going to change dramatically out of this. How are people going to travel or experience other places differently? I would say more virtually. I think we may actually see the... The, you know, what was the trip to Bali is now going to turn into what is the movie programming we are going to watch? I think video games. I think that if there's any next big thing in the advertising world of OTT, mm -hmm. as we've talked about and over the top, there's a lot of over the top viewing, but there aren't very many over the top ads. However, the gaming industry is starting to find models on the mobile side, the video game industry. <clears throat> and so I think and now that the industry is moving to free to play games and you have tens of millions of people playing games for free, the companies make money because they, they buy virtual goods, they buy capabilities, um, they um, buy cosmetics, a different shield, a different um, I jersey. Second, I think Second Life, which has always been I think, profitable. Remember Second Life with you can buy yes. virtual yep. goods? And we, I was covering them many, many years ago because I actually started out in the VR business in the early 90s. And um, but Second Life, I think, is seeing a resurgence. But I should triple check that. That's yeah. But look at look at where Second Life morphed to Fortnite, Apex. It it is these 50 million people playing these battle royale games, most of them for free, a small number of them paying billions of dollars in fees and transactions. Doesn't that sound like early cable when we were getting MTV and ESPN and and we're someone said like it's gonna have ads some days. We're like, no, you can't put ads on MTV or because I'm paying for my cable. Uh, I actually just realized that um, uh, um, we are running a massively out of time here. Okay. So there's so much more we could discuss. But <laughs> I, I um, this was so much fun, Dave. I hate to cut it short because that's okay, Tracy. I, I I really enjoyed this. This is great. Okay, great. Um, we we should all we should have a session at TVOT about physics and TV. I would love to oh, do that. I would love to, but yeah, Seth, Seth Haberman has to be part of it because he's oh, the of professor course. of it. Of course, of course. Um, you know, I, and I'll just quickly tell you my uh, the first year we the first we year we did um, TVOT. We invited. Why am I losing my? Uh, we invited a, a great physicist to tell us about the relationship between um, science fiction and TV, physics, science fiction, and TV. I'll uh, have to send you the link to what his whole talk. Um, that's another story. I'm probably going to cut that part out. I don't know. Anyway, thank you so much, Dave. Uh, uh, we're going to look forward to seeing what Simul Media, S-I-M-U-L-M-E-D-I-A.com, is doing in the future. Please go to Dave's column at Media Post. And uh, 
and dig in because he's got uh, fantastic writing skills. You have fantastic writing skills, Dave. Thank you. And um, industry analysis skills. I hope we are all able to figure out how to help the TV industry. That's the, the goal of Television Nation is to bring us all together so we can have fun chats like this and figure out what we need to do to maybe the brainstorming we just did, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you so much. You're welcome, Tracy. Thank you, and I'm really happy that you're safe and healthy, and, um, and we look forward to getting television into the next phase of its future existence. Thank you. You too, and to your family. This thank is you. Tracy Swedlow of Television Nation, and Dave Morgan, who's the CEO of Simul Media. Thank you so much. See ya. Okay, cut. <laughs>